Welcome to God's Vision in Motion. I'm Evangelist Willie Smith, and thanks for joining me once again. I'm back, and right now I'd like to pray, Father God, I thank you for your word. Your word is alive. It's a living thing. I thank you that it will not return void. I thank you will speak through me to the people that you have called, those that have ears to hear, Father God. I thank you for them. I thank you for those that that do not know you as their Lord and their Savior, that if they hear this message, there will be something said that will give them a little nugget, a little something that they can go and search out the scripture to find out if these things are so that I'm saying. Because there's a, and what I want to talk about today is, what I want to talk about today is the third person of the Trinity. And the third part, uh, person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one that will teach us. And I want to show you from this, from Scripture because it's bothered me. There's something bubbling in my spirit for as I go out into the community, as I visit in, uh, uh, some other uh, places, that I see people, uh, pastors have people in bondage because they're not really teaching them who they are. They're not really seeing spiritual growth that people can stand. And it comes from teaching. It's come from the leadership, the teaching people. Most of them standing in the pulpit don't even know that they're saved. Talking about I'm an old sinner saved by grace. And, and you can't be both. Either you're one or the other. And, and you're trying to teach people. You're standing in an office. Evidently, you must not have been called by God. You might have been called by your denomination. But you certainly wasn't called from God because God is not the author of confusion. And so one of the things that, that's bothered me about the Holy Spirit, we, we welcome people into your pulpit you don't, that's not saved because they've been trained. You welcome them, but not one time you welcome the Holy Spirit, who is your leader, who is your guide. Not one time you talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Not one time the gifts of the Spirit are operating in the ministry. And, and the thing about it is that you need to turn around. You need to take heed to what what the Spirit of God is saying to you. Don't look at this camera and say that he's saying it. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to you because you're the only one that can turn this thing around where you begin to see people not running to an altar every time. You look around the same people night and day. You have three services, same people up there running. You need to be able to teach them how to grow and how to stand up for the things of God, how to be a leader, how that they can be an example by not being a stumbling block when other people see them running to the altar every service. It's a stumbling block to those who are sitting by looking. They said if it ain't working for them, if they have to be running to an altar every time and look around crying and mumbling grum, how is it going to help me? How will it benefit me if I get a hold of this? I mean, this is how the world will do it. Somewhere you need to be able to teach those that you call, that you say God has placed you over to be able to teach them to stand against the wiles of the devil. You need to tell them that we have an enemy, an enemy to their faith, an enemy that comes to kill and steal and to destroy. You need to be able to tell them. And I want to point this scripture out to those who are listening to me that say that they are believers. In the book of uh, Luke chapter 10, and we're going to look at this, chapter, this verse here, verse 19. Now, this scripture is talking to believers. It says here, we're talking to believers now. I want you to get your, ear, get your ears open that you may hear and that you may understand because I'm running into people out there every day. Want to find out they have left church after church, going here and going there only because of the, they're not being spiritually fed. And that's what they're looking for. They're running to and from. And the Bible said, woe to those who scatter the flock. And I want you to see this scripture here. This is not just for preachers. This is for believers. Right here it says, but I, behold, I give you power to tread on, on serpents, over scorpion, and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, that's talking to believers right there. He's giving this power to you. So if he's giving you this power, what are you doing with it? Are you running to the altar every week because, and you have the same power? The only thing that the pastors they have, those of us as ministers, is a responsibility. That's all we have. The same power been given to every believer. In John 
Mark chapter 15 and 16, when he give us to say, go into all the world and preach the gospel. To, this, is, this is a commandment to believers that we go, that we have authority, that we have a power. But if you're running on your knees crying to the pastor and crying to everybody every week, the same one, what, what's so irritating about it, you're a stumbling block to somebody else and you don't even realize it. You're being a stumbling block. You're not really teaching the people how to stand up and believe God for themselves. You know, how to stand. And, and, and me, I always want to say, my first pastor I had said, the first thing he said to me that ministered to me, don't you want to hear God know that, don't you want to know that God hear you when you pray? And man, I got a hold to that. I said, that makes sense. I don't have to run to the press all the time. He can pray for somebody else that's just coming into the fold. He got time to tend to those baby sheep. But those of us who sit under the word every day and you're responsible because you run into church, you don't miss. And that's where it's so important that you don't miss church. But church is not in you because you're not standing up as a man. And the Bible talks about how can two walk together unless they agree. How can you sit in a... In, you sit in a, a administration, you can sit in the office as a leader, as a pa assistant pastor, and you can sit and not help correct the pastor. Paul had to correct some that in his day, he had to face some, go to some face to face and said, no, you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments anymore. You don't have to keep the uh, be, uh, 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 circumcised. It is by faith. He's telling them the just shall live by faith. And in a few minutes, we're going to look at the script. But I just have to vent because I'm walking in. I'm running into people that go to church every week. And I st we start talking to them about the things of God. Things that they should know about being baptized. What it means to be baptized. What it means that when we come together and partake of communion. And, and the scripture tell us what will happen to that person if he's taking communion in an unworthy manner. And so those are the type of things that we know. The gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 14, and 15. Those are scriptures. Let's look, let's look at those. Let's look at those scriptures. These script, uh, particular script in 1 Corinthians. And we're going to look at uh, chapter 15. Uh, 15. So I think it's 14 of 15. And, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm moving 2 Corinthians. I need to go to 1 Corinthians. Okay. Take these off because I think I can see a little bit better without them. It's in verse 8 here it says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. These are gifts. These are spiritual gifts. In verse 12, chapter 12. Let's look at chapter 12. Chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 1. It says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. You know those Gentiles carried away those dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I, have given, wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaketh of the Spirit of God called Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. By the Holy Ghost. No man can come because people are thinking that they can go out and they can do this and, and everybody going to be saved and all and do all these tip of, tip of things. But I want you to see this word here. This is where we're going to go from here. The Holy Ghost. And we find places in the Bible where when people, where the, the Holy Spirit is explaining who God, who, who this Holy Spirit is. Who is the Holy Spirit? And so we're going to look at these particular scriptures because it talks about the, the gifts of wisdom. But he says, but all these work, in verse 11, but all these work by the same spirit, divine to every man as he will. So it has something to do with your will. In other words, you've got to be able to understand, be able to seek God for these particular spirit. And these particular spiritual gifts work as you minister not it's a gift just given to you to go around and do what you want to do, but as you begin to minister and the enemy comes a, a, a attack in that ministry, the Holy Spirit will give you, give you discerning of spirit. What spirit is this? What spirit is going on in the midst of my service? 
when someone speak out in a heavenly language, the pastor, the head of the pastor ought to be able to know what said and be able to interpret what is going on. There's somebody in that ministry ought to be able to interpret what is being said. And that's why he said, I have you not to be ignorant. And so as a person began, it ought to be to edify, to comfort, not condemnation where you're talking about somebody's business and all that stuff. But actually the person that it might need it doesn't even know you're talking about him. But he knows it's the Holy Spirit that ministered to his spirit. And so we, the thing about it is that none of these gifts are operating in most of the churches around here. Most of these gifts are not talked about. Nobody can leave talking about what they've learned about the gifts of the spirit. They're not encouraged. They're not encouraged to stand up for themselves. How do I stand? The Bible says when you're done all to stand. When you're going through something, to go through means that you went through this thing, and now when you come out on the other side, you know yourself that it was God that got you on. There's no quick fixes. I want you to know right now, there's no quick fixes where you go out and you done live like a dog, done all this stuff, and somebody just lay hands on you. You've been beat down by the, you know, the, the person that you're living with. You know you have no bit of God didn't put you with it. So you're getting beat down. You feel you feel like a dog and everything. Then you come and the, somebody lay hands on you and you go back and you come back the same day or the same night feeling the same way when you need to get a hold to the spirit of God. Because I want to show you some scriptures in here because people are running up talking about I need a clean heart. I need this kind of. And lay hands on me, you can get this. And lay hands on me, you get that. And you're doing something that God, that's something God does. And he says here in the book, let's go to the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 36. Let's look at the book of Ezekiel. I want you to see this. I have some other scriptures in that. But I want you to see this for yourself. It's something God, you're trying to do something that God said he would do. He already done it. All you have to do is walk in it. Everything that we have, everything that, that we need, God already has provided for us. And all you have to do is believe it. And one of the things you need to do is solve it. The Bible says God hates pride. Drop your pride and turn around and say, I was wrong. I was wrong. I need to do this. I need to turn around. The Bible says God resisted the proud and give grace to the humble. I thank God I've been one of, I'm one of the humble. And I know I haven't arrived, but I thank God to I have my understanding been open that I know what the hope which I've been called. So let's look at 36, Ezekiel 36, 26. 36, 20. It says here, a new heart, a new heart also will I give you. A new spirit I will put in you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart. I will give you a heart of flesh. And so the thing about it, God, this is something that God is doing. Look at that, 36, 26. And then we're going to look at Hebrews chapter, uh, Hebrews, uh, I believe it's 6, Hebrews chapter 8. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 8. And let's look at verse 10. Verse 10 here says, do you have it? I'm going to give you a chance to find it. Hebrews 8, 10. But I, I think I'll go to verse, start at verse 6 here. It says here, but now he had obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much more he is the mediator. And he's talking about Christ, the one who died for you. If you're a believer, this is he's a mediator for you, praying for you daily. A mediator of a better covenant, which he has established upon better promises. For if the for if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, The days coming, said the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now according to now according to the covenant that I had made with their fathers, in that day I took them by the hand and led them out, out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. Even though they had it, they didn't do it. 
It is the same thing going on today. They're not doing what God have called them to do. And that's to reach the laws. The laws come to church and they go back laws. And that's sad. That's a sad statement. And people are crying, mumbling, groaning about they're so concerned about people come, getting lost and people hitting and dying in the streets and everything. But even when they come to church, they leave without knowing that they are saved, without their being redeemed from the curse of the law. They don't understand. They don't understand it because it's not teach. There's no Bible study set aside to I'm gonna teach, I'm gonna teach these people because that's been your calling. That's what God has called you to do, to teach the people. If you call yourself a pastor, not an evangelist, but if you call yourself a pastor, he said, feed my sheep and feed my lamb. Why? That we can grow up. Most Everything that eats real good, they grow up one way or the other, either grow out or up. <laughs> so if you find out the, your spiritual food, because I want to share that with you, because the spiritual food will always nourish you and you will find less and less people in your congregation down and outers, down and out. I'm reaching everybody without Christ is a down and out without God and without hope. That's what the scripture says. You without, at that time, you without, until you came to Christ, but you without, without God and you were without hope. But now, you have hope if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You have a new heart. He says here, let's look at verse 10, verse eight, uh, chapter 8 and verse 10. I, that's where I would really want to go. He says here, for this is the covenant. Now, we just saw it in the book of Ezekiel. He was, to, he, he was prophesying. But this is over in the New Testament. This is where he. This is what he was prophesying about. He said, and we saw that he's a mediator. We saw that Jesus Christ is the mediator. Now let's read on. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. In those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them. I will be to them a God, and they shall. And they shall be to me a people, and that and they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every every man every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. All shall know me. But this is it has to be qualified. And that's the thing that most people don't tell you. Oh, the Lord is this, and the Lord is that. But it has to be qualified. By what? By how you live. By how you get a hold to the word of God. How you thirst after righteousness. And he said those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they will be the one filled. Those who are diligent seeking him. And so one of the things that we, we have to do, we have to put aside, lay aside every sin and every weight which so easily beset us. And look unto Jesus, the one that died on the cross. For our salvation. Now we got people now they say when they believe people to the Lord. This is one this is one that really and I wonder, I said, Lord, I said to myself, oh, that, did that person really get saved? Because Jesus said in, in John chapter, it said, In that day, you should ask me nothing. But whatever you ask the Father in my name, I will do it. And so when you come to when you come to get saved, you don't pray to Jesus. Jesus, God, the one sent the gift. You pray to God in the name of Jesus. That the, in other words, have them to pray that fact. But not you pray it for them. You can lead them, but not you pray the prayer for them. They have to pray. They have to repeat. They have to accept because he said, believe in your heart because you can say anything. He said, you also have to believe in your heart, not you believe in, for your, in your heart for that person. He have to be the one to say, I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. I'm a sinner. So dear God in heaven, I come to you because I'm a sinner. And I believe that your, your son died on, your, on the cross for my salvation. And I received that. And he said, based upon that, uh, let's, let's go there. Let's, let's go to Romans. Let's go to Romans 10, 9, and 10. Romans 10. Verses 9 and 10. 
right here says in verses 9, let's look at 9. He says a word, uh, a word of faith. Now, we've got people talk about faith. Everything that you get from God have to do with faith. And I would ask the person any kind of uh, question about this. If you're asking God for something stupid, and God knows that he knows the beginning, you think you're going to get it? So why worry about whether per, how much this faith, I hear people talk, that faith bunch. Well, what you're doing really except separating yourself from faith, because the Bible said the just, the just shall live by faith. So let's look at this. Well, let's go ahead and look at this scripture here in the book of Romans in chapter 10. The word that says that if thou shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart, that God had raised him from the dead, thou shall be, what? Saved. Period. It doesn't say nothing about you have to confess your sin. Come confess all your dirt. It don't say anything about that. Repent means turn around. I was doing that, but no longer I'm doing that. He said, let's look at it again. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in the heart that God had raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's righteousness means right standing with God. Righteous and with the, with the mouth. Confession is me unto salvation. And that means you come and you say, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I, I remember this pastor, this guy, he, he was a evangelist, but I think he passed away now. But he said he was running home one night. And Evangelist was on the street corner preaching and called out, hey, sinner. And he said, he stopped dead in his tracks and got down on the curb and gave his life to the sinner. Who out here? Who out here know me? Because you know who you are. If you're a sinner, you already know that you're a sinner. And if you save, you know when you sin. And this is something that we need to talk about here because this covenant, the Ten Commandment, is not all of the law. In this, this grace that we have, this grace that God has given us, he said we are saved by grace. But this grace has to be worked out by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when he talks about I be, uh, put these laws into our spirit, into our minds, and thing, the Holy Spirit is the one who bring, let us know that we, we committed a, a, a sin act. The Holy Spirit is the one that will guide you. He will lead you. And we're going to look at this. We're going to look at this here because the Bible said we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. We've been set free. But the whole bottom line is we have to walk. It has to be qualified by us, our lifestyle. How do we walk? How do we live? How do we treat our brother? How do we pray for those who are in, the, in authority? We, it's easy. To, we, we can always stand back and talk about what they're not doing. But do we pray, uh, us who are believers have an obligation to pray for that pastor? And I'm talking about pray the word. I'm not just talking about go off and pray some crazy stuff you thinking up in your head. But you need to get scripture and stand on these particular scriptures to let God know that he, because the only thing he's going to confirm is his word. He's not going to confirm your good idea, my good idea, but he's going to confirm his word. Now we're going to turn to John chapter 14. I believe it's John, yeah, John chapter 14, and I want to show you something here because this is our, the, our helper. This is, and, and, uh, and I want to show you another scripture, so if you say, well, I don't need that. I want to read you a scripture over in, uh, let's see, I believe it's Acts chapter, what did I say, turn, John chapter 14, but I got to read this scripture, or I, just, I must. Okay. John chapter, let's look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16 and verse 13. It says, How be it when the Spirit, when He, how be it when He, the Spirit of truth is come. And He's talking about, if you go back and read some of the other scripture, those of us who are studying the Word of God, uh, He will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he shall show you things to come. 
he shall glorify me. He shall receive of mine and show it unto you. Now we're talking, he's talking here about the Holy Spirit. If you have any problem about the Holy Spirit, he tell you who the comforter is, the Holy Spirit. And now one of the things I want to do, I want to try to go ahead here and really show you who the, what, what happens when you say, I don't need that. Or you don't believe this. Let me look at, we're going to look at Acts. Did I write this? Acts chapter 13. I believe it's Acts 13 2. Okay, Acts chapter 2. The Holy Ghost is a person. Some people say that God, he's a force. But the Holy Spirit is a, uh, uh, is, a, is a person. And we're going to look at it right here. It says, as they ministered, this is talking about Paul, the disciples. He says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. <laughs> now, uh, I don't know whether force ever said anything, but I'm, I'm looking at this, and to me, this is a person. If the Holy Spirit said, he says, separate me, Barnabas. And Saul, for the working where he, whereunto I have called them. And when they had fastened and prayed and, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, be, so they be, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. That's what I want you to see. That the Holy Spirit is the one that uh, said to go. Most of us now are going and, we don't, and nobody sent us. Maybe your denomination told you to go. We read some scriptures in that Bible talking about Jesus said, go into all the world and greater works than these you should do. But that is not what that is talking about. He was just talking about he was only one person, could be in one place at one time. And even though he had 12, they could only be in one place. They could only go so far and travel at that particular time because traveling is not like it is today. You can be everywhere. But the thing he was talking about is so many of us who claim to be Christian, who have accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Our next door neighbors ought to know that we are Christian. We ought to be able to minister all to everybody in your community. There's another Christian over there. Thousands of Christians. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about these little silly women laying up, up, up in the church working themselves, deserting their family, deserting their husband, out there working themselves to the bone every day. He's talking about greater work because we go... We can go with our money, with our finances. I can't go to Africa. Don't have no desire to go to Africa. But those who have a calling, who God have called, who are anointed them to go and do work out in Africa in different places, they have the tongue to be able to speak. It wouldn't do no good to send me to Africa. He, he have enough problem with me right here in the United States. So why would he want to send me over to Africa somewhere when I can send them? I can send people with my money. When I know of people that's doing something, when I know people are dealing, people are getting saved, I see the work because they're letting, coming back and testifying of what is going on. How many people got saved? How many people you know got saved? In your church. How many members do you have? In your church. You can't tell nobody. Everybody's a member. I walk in today, I can go to work in the end of some of these services right now. You don't know what I believe? I have you have I don't know what you what you believe and what you preach. All I know is that hey, come on in, you want to us. That's not the way that God run the church. Those who come in ought to be coming in in a, a new members class that they can learn, that they can grow, and and there ought to be a, t a count of how many people. So someone even asked you, well, how many members? Well, we got a lot of folk. We got a lot of this. We got a lot of that. People don't want to see that. They want to see if you, people oh, what what you got on the books, whose name is on the roll. Not to keep them in bondage, but how to be able to minister to you the people that have been sent to under your shepherd. As a as a shepherd, you need to know this. Now, if you're smarter than God, then you sure enough have a problem because God always wanted to know have a sensor of how many people was there. How many people did, uh, and separate so many to be able to feed them and be able to 
do different things. God will have to have them to take a censor. Now, if you're smarter than him, you really got a problem. But I want to say to you, if you have heed, take those that have ears to hear. Let them hear what the Spirit is saying, because God will not allow his people to be still scattered about here and there to every wind and doctrine going. He's not going to allow it. And you can mark my word, you need to turn around, just like a sinner going wrong, and he turn around, come back and accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He's been set free, and you can do the same thing. And the minister will flourish, the minister will grow, and it'll be easy. It'll be easy because you're doing it God's way, the gifts of the Spirit, believing in the Holy Ghost. Now, we have a scripture here when it talks about uh, Ananias, I believe it's Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, for we hear nothing nothing about the Holy Ghost. It, yeah, here it is in Acts chapter 5. Let's look at Acts chapter 5. I want that shown on the screen where the people can see it. That way they won't say, well, you say, you say, and it's not. But if you see it for yourself, then you have an obligation to, to be able to turn and change. It says here, these, this is when the church started. Everybody wanted to bring everything that they had on their own free will. They weren't uh, pushed to do it. They weren't arm twisted to bring their tithes and their offering in. But they did it out of free will because something had happened, the uh, thing was taking place, and they wanted everybody. It says none suffer lack. None suffer lack. And this is what God wants us to be able to do, to be able to minister in a way that is out of love. To give out of love, not out of the old covenant where they had to do it. And if they didn't do it, they suffered the consequences. And we will too in the spirit if we, we don't follow God's laws. And the Holy Spirit will always lead us into all truth. That's what the Bible says. The Holy Ghost will lead you in all truth. He will take your mind. If you're having a problem with the flesh, he will, in any area. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. There's no quick hand laid on you and you can just go on back and live like a dog once again. Let's look at this. It says here in uh, John cha uh, Acts chapter 5, there was a certain man named Ananias and, and with his wife, Sapphira, his wives. They sold some possession and they kept back part of the price, his wife also being pr privileged to it, and brought it a certain port part and laid it at the apostle feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why have the Satan lied to their heart, to the Holy Ghost? No, let me read that again. Let me read it, let me read it right. But Peter said, why have Satan filled their heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And, he, and to keep back part of the price of the land which remained, was it not in their own? In other words, it was in his own power. He sold it, but it was in his own power to keep. And he said, but see these things in their heart, that God has not, but you have not lied unto men, but unto God. And the same thing happened to his wife. He was carried out dead. He died. He was carried out. And so, as you begin to see these particular scriptures, it tells you now, and the part I want you to see about when he talks about the Holy Ghost, and then he goes on now, he said, but you lied to God. So the Holy Spirit is God. And so if you saying, I don't need the Holy Ghost. We don't believe that here. We don't believe it. Well, we don't encourage it. Well, it's the same thing. There's no middle ground, so either you do or you don't. And so the Holy Ghost will always direct you. He will always lead you. If you're looking for a husband, you're looking for a wife, trust the Holy Spirit. Don't go ask some man, some, you don't know what he believes. You don't know nothing. You don't, you hope he will, but you need to be able to say, I'm trusting God that he will send me. He will always encourage me. He will give me a, 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 a little nudge in my spirit if this is the right person I need to be. Because one of the things that my I, I've learned Hid my family. I watch my. Ch I don't get them and say they don't go mess with this person because he's white, because he's black, because he's this color. This is, we don't talk that kind of talk here at our house. But I notice that when my children bring somebody home, it's somebody that is worthwhile. They seem to have 
something of God's spirit about them. They seem to be going somewhere. They seem to be people of integrity when they take up with somebody. And that's good. That's good news. And it's like a, a sometimes I have to pat myself on the back because I don't go around telling them, oh, you don't date no so and so and so. God said, God, the Bible said, God so loved the world. He loves everybody. And the thing about it, some people have used this scripture in the Bible about being unequally yoked with an with uh, uh, with another person, and they use it as a black and white thing. The Bible's not talking about that. He's talking about an unbeliever. You're dealing with a person that's not even saved. You're running around bringing people home, sleeping in your house. They're not even saved. So you open the door for the devil, and the Bible says, give the devil no place. So when you invite the devil in and things start happening to you, don't be surprised because they come in with baggage. They can't come in spending the night. They come in with unbelief in, in those. And your children shouldn't be hanging out with unbelievers. But it comes from training. It comes from teaching. It comes from being a good example to them, who I take up with. And we're not saying anything about being perfect. We're just saying we walk in the things of God, that we give our time over to God because God is our source. God is our everything. And the thing about it, we have to trust him. And I'm, I want to share with you right now, if you are out there, and you want to, something is going on in your spirit. You know you need power. And you're a believer. That's what qualified you, a believer. Right now, I would say to you, receive the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus' name. He's a free gift and he must be received. You don't get it when you're baptized. You don't get it when the pastor baptized you, even though he recognized the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But the gift of the Spirit must be received after you get saved. And so right now, I would say to you, receive the Holy Ghost. And that one that's not saved, open your mouth and say, Jesus, uh, God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I'm a sinner. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And right now, I accept him as my Lord and Savior. In my heart. I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead for my gratification, and I thank you for it, that I've been redeemed right now. I believe it, and I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've been redeemed. I believe that right now in Jesus' name. Amen.